So that's the first item on our agenda. This morning, political pensions and entitlements. Uh, from if you look at the from the papers that we shared with you earlier, the Daily Trust, you know, lists ex-governor's benefits and as they vary across all the states. You know, there's gratuity on pension, there's houses, there's car security, furniture allowances, health, and on and on like that. Some of the states have four ex-governors, some have three, a number of them have two ex-governors as at this moment. So question this morning, how relevant is this, you know, to any development and who does it does this benefit? Well, one of the issues that have been raised around this is that look, on the one hand, is the fact that pensioners, which is the what aggravate what brought this whole conversation up in the first place, the Zampara State example, where the law had to be uh, upturned because the governor made that request for monthly emolument of ten million naira, among other things. Joining us to discuss this this morning is. Mr. Ebu Olu Adeboro, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I, first of all, what's your impression of the Zamfara example? I think it's unfortunate, uh, to say the least, uh, when you realize what is going on within the economy, when you realize that it's taking so long to negotiate minimum wage for the average worker at 30,000 Naira, and then a public uh, servant, uh, office holder rather, retires, uh, paid himself 300 million Naira, and then is uh, entitled to 10 million Naira monthly uh, pension. Uh, it's quite scandalous, to say the least. Uh, because, you know, when you say pension, it's something that is payable to somebody who has worked and retired and no longer has capacity to earn a living. So the state offers to compensate him for all the years that such a person has put in in the service. So if you are no longer able to earn a living through active work, maybe because of old age or because of redundancy, then it's expected that the state will take care of you until you die. But when a person is agile, is just less than 60 years old, and is able to earn a living through other means, such a person is not entitled to, uh, to pension, because that's not the idea in law. But when you look at that letter that is circulating purportedly from the office of the former uh, governor, and that letter cited some law. I mean, he, uh, the letter quoted some law that was enacted and signed, and it wasn't just a request out of the blues. Now, I'm trying to differentiate between, you know, emotions and what the law provides. He cited a law in the state. So based on that law, let's look at it from that angle. Is he not entitled to it? First of all, uh, I think it's improper for somebody to retire from office and then create an office by himself and design a letterhead with the logo of the state and say office of the former governor. That does not exist in law. There's nothing like that. You are a former governor, you have left office, you are not entitled to any other office. So that office? That office is illegal, clearly. Number two is that indeed there are laws all over Nigeria enacted by the National Assembly and the various houses of the assembly of the states uh, paying all manner of money to ex-public officers. And this started in 1998. When we decided that we were tired of the military, so the argument came about what kind of incentive we can give to so many of them who have held positions. Because the challenge is always that we have these retired people or these generals who just feel that they are not earning enough. So they then are attracted to hold public office. So people say, what do we do to discourage those who have held uh, offices from coming back to topu government? So he then came up during the Abdul Salami Abubakar regime when he was negotiating to hand over. Uh, they promulgated a law called remuneration for former presidents and heads of states, by which uh, it was suggested that those heads of states should be taken care of. 350,000 naira per month for ex-presidents and heads, heads of state, and 250,000 for the deputy. And then all manner of other Pequisites uh, were then put in there, entitled to a house, 
uh, entitled to an office, entitled to medical allowance, entitled to cars, entitled to AIDS, entitled to all manner of things. So the idea then was that if these people are well taken care of, they will be discouraged from planning coup or from coming to top of civilian government. Uh, we, we kicked against this. I remember that Chief Ghanifai me went to court to challenge it, especially when somebody has taken over power by force, such as maybe through a coup d'etat. He shouldn't be rewarded for doing what is illegal. But of course, uh, they got away with it. And when the National Assembly came in 1999, it ratified that law. Uh, and then by the time uh, civilians came across the state, Lagos State started it, you know, for the former governor, uh, Ashwa Jibola Metinumbu, and reeled out their own, uh, and, uh, and promulgated their own law, rather, uh, allowing six cars for former governors, allowing uh, medical allowance of about 100 million naira, allowing that the former governor should be entitled to a house in Lagos and another house in Abuja, with retinue of AIDS, and then allowances for furniture, 300% of basic salary as pension. So after that, Obongata took it over in uh, Akwaimbo State and reeled out very humongous uh, sums of money. Just and so that, that's, that's the genesis of-, of those, those laws are still in place. Oh, so they are. So they they're are still in, in practice. This is what happens across those states as yeah, we speak now. Those laws are in, in place because I think that there's a challenge about those who get into uh, the various legislative houses. Because the idea of the constitution or in our nation is that matters relating to remuneration should be centralized. So the constitution creates what we call revenue mobilization and fiscal allocation commission, which is meant to harmonize the entitlement of public office holders. And so they have already codified what a minister will earn what a governor will earn, what a president will earn. And when you go to the constitution itself in section 44 of the exclusive legislative list, it says that matters relating to pensions is only reserved for the National Assembly. That's the, at the national level. Yes. So you hear the controversy that says states perhaps do not have a right to wade into that since it's exclusive. So how do you, I mean, we see, we've seen what happened in Zamfara. How do you now weigh into that, seeing that it's meant to be exclusively at the national level. That's the point I'm making, that when you say something is within the exclusive legislative list, it means that only the National Assembly can legislate on it. And that has been done by creating the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Allocation Commission, which has already codified the salary of ex-public holders. But of course, there's confusion, because when you go to Section 125 of that same constitution, it empowers the House of Assembly of a state to make laws to regulate the pension of the governor or deputy governor. Now, I was going to ask you if, they, if it was within the purview of the House of Assembly of each state to make such laws, and I think that has been cleared for what you have just said now. So doesn't that then make nonsense of the whole process or the privileges of making those laws if a House of Assembly can just come up make those laws simply for the interest of one particular individual or one particular government, and another comes and you know, upturns it. I think that this has just highlighted the crisis we have with our constitution. Why many of us have said that we need to sit down and take a holistic look at this document, because it's speaking crisis and confusion. Now, if you run a federation, you don't centralize things. Federation means that I mean, the coordinating states will have the power to determine their destiny according to their resources. So, but of course, you know, it's a constitution produced by the military. So they centralize appointment of judges, they centralize payment of pensions. There's no reason why things like electricity, pension, should be the business of the federal government. But that has been the position in the constitution. So there is a confusion in the constitution as it is, and it can only be resolved by a court. And I think Serap is already in court to determine the legality of those laws passed by the various houses of assembly of the states, whether they have the capacity to make those laws. Personally, if you ask me, if you say we have a federation, uh, each state should have the capacity to determine their resources. So having made those laws concerning pensions and allowances, from your perspective, you think they are right to have done that? Uh, I think that you could make a law to take care of 
the benefit of those who hold public office, but it should be a one-time law. Because you look at the resources of the state, and then you look at what ordinary workers are earning. When you say you want to pay pension to somebody, it should be something that is meant to uh, augment that person when he's no longer active. Okay. You cannot be re a retired person and be active at the same time. If you leave office as a governor, maybe at the age of 55, at the age of 60, and then you contest office to become a senator, and you can't be uh, calling yourself retired to be entitled to earn pension, you know, and then you go to public office again, you are a senator, and you are earning salary as a senator, and then you are also earning pension well, some, in your some state, of, some of or you become would, a minister. Some of them would argue and say, look, when I'm in office as senator or as minister, I'm not getting pensions from my, from my state. No, if it's a former governor, uh, there's no doubt that they receive it. But is this illegal or this is a moral issue? I, I think I'd like to separate that. Is this that it is legal when you have former governors that are now senators or ministers, depending on the case maybe, uh, on the case rather, is this illegal for them to get, you know, the... It's illegal on the it's one hand, illegal. and also it's moral. It's illegal in the sense that there is a code of conduct for public officers. And that code of conduct <clears throat> has specified the nature of the kind of behavior you expect from public officers. It's in the Constitution. Now, paragraph four of that code of conduct for public officers says that a public officer who has retired is not entitled to or shall not receive remuneration in respect of another active public office. And then they excluded legislators from that. So the point I'm making is this. It's clear. And I think if you recall, when Serap took this matter up with the uh, past uh, National Assembly, the Senate president then, uh, Dr. Bukola Sarak, he said he was not aware. And but then that now that he's been brought to his attention, he wrote to the Kwara state government to stop paying uh, him pension because of that provision. So if you are to enforce that provision of the code of conduct, then it becomes illegal completely for anybody who has held public office to then be earning uh, salary. And let me break it down very well, if you allow me. Let's take the case of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, by the remunerations of former presidents and past heads of state act, he, is a head, he, he was a head of state in 1984. So he's entitled to those perquisites and salaries itemized in that law. Now, by virtue of his training, he's a general, major general in the army. The Armed Forces Act also has provisions for pension for retired generals. And then now he's a president. And so he, he will be earning pension. I don't know whether this particular president is earning it, but I'm just analyzing the what provisions the, of yeah. what the law says. He will be earning uh, the entitlements under the remunerations of former president and heads of state. He will be earning entitlement as a retired major general in the Nigeria army. And then now he's a serving president and he's also earning salary as a serving president. So the idea is that, you know, I've talked about the law. The other then is that it is totally wrong. If you are earning a salary in multiple dimensions, that gives the impression of conflict of interest. Both morally and legally. Yes, morally and legally. Let's, let's go to that moral uh, perspective of it now. Uh, the law has some moral considerations granted, but let's look at the morality politically now. Uh, do you think the moral angles or ambits of these considerations were made or put into consideration by the politicians who initiated these ideas in the first place? Do you think they considered the ability or not of their states to be able to sustain that kind of expenses? I, I don't think they did uh, because I, 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 I happen to listen to uh, uh, hard copy, Mark Peug, when he interviewed the former governor of Lagos State, uh, Mr. Bart Deraji Fashola, SAN. And this issue came up. And the governor said, I, I feel challenged personally that it looks immoral for me uh, when I have a means of living as a lawyer. And so I only offered myself in public office to go and serve. So if I have finished that service, I don't think I'm entitled to continue to collect. And he said he wrote to uh, the Lagos State government to stop that uh, 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 salary. So really from the moral angle, I think that there's something wrong in 
you earning pension. You know, because when you say pension, you talk about somebody who is a teacher, who has grown to the stage of headmaster, who probably has worked 30 years in the service. And so there is a reason for expecting that when he leaves service, you continue to reward him. But somebody who is not in civil service, a political office holder, who just came and contested the election and won and served four years, he didn't go through any system, and then when he's Some leaving... Some might say he's a public servant. Hey, that's public what service. I'm saying, that you offered yourself to serve. Mm -hmm. So that offer is enough reward for you in terms of you coming to offer that service for a short period. But they, they will say so you can pay gratuity, let it be once and for all. Mm -hmm. Or you put a condition to it to say when he attains the age of 70 or when he's unable to be engaged in active service. But you can't be rewarding somebody who is 50 years old and is alive and active and is still contesting office, he's still serving as a minister. I think there's a problem with that. And you know, some people draw inference with you know, civil service where you have to have worked for at least 10 years before you're entitled to pension or work up to a, a particular age. And some others are saying maybe there should be a contributory pension scheme for uh, ex-governors, but that's a you know, topic for another day. But you know, the big talk is now, because of this controversy, some people are saying that maybe, and I need, to, I need to get your candid opinion, is it fair, people that are saying now that they should actually return those monies that they earned over that period of time, now that people are saying it is illegal, it is not moral, is it fair to now ask them to refund those monies? Well, number one, I believe that the money we talk about is from the public treasury. Uh, it's not money that it belongs to a private person or a company. So if you have earned money from the public purse, illegally or wrongfully, of course, when it becomes clear that you were not entitled to it, so that means there was no basis for it in the first place. So the person should be asked to refund the money. And I'm glad that Serap is in court, uh, and the matter is before the Federal High Court in Abuja, seeking to recover over 40 billion naira earned by these former governors uh, uh, in the name of these uh, several laws that are made. And then the other point is this. We must find a way to discourage this in order to discourage corruption. Because when you make public office too attractive, then you know, it denies the professions or the capacity of skilled people to go into their profession. Because what is happening now is that in Nigeria, we, ha we say we have a depressed economy. Things are tough, things are difficult, we're enduring, believing that it will get better. But the only person you can approach in this nation who will not be lamenting about hard cash is either a civil servant or a public office holder who have access to money. So I'm saying that we must make it look like when you go to public office to serve, you are rendering service. We shouldn't make it too attractive. Otherwise, people are no longer seeing the need to go to school. People are no longer seeing the need to go through training to spend so much time to go through uh, pupillage as a lawyer and begin to trust in hard work and wait for your time. Become a senior advocate. That, well, so if it's possible for a, a school dropout to contest office as a counselor or contest office as a governor and win, and is any hundred million naira per annum on the medical bills, whether he's sick or not, I think that there's a problem in that. Do you think it's something that the National Assembly can legislate on, you know, a legislation that will be over, that will bear on all the states because even in Australia, uh, it's an issue already. Uh, one of the issues that the parliament in in Australia is looking at is that they want to scrap politicians' six-figure pensions that will save the nation something in the region of three hundred and fifty million dollars. So, do you think it's something the National Assembly can say, okay, let's make a law that will stop all this happening at the states? It's going to be a challenge legally, uh, like I say. Like I said earlier, uh, if we are running a federation, the state should be allowed some element of freedom or autonomy. Forgive me for butting in. You said the other time that they, this is one of those things on the exclusive, exclusive list, list, paragraph 44 okay. of the exclusive legislative list of the current constitution, okay. which we have, okay. makes matter of pension, gratuity, and those items, remuneration to be within the exclusive competence of the National Assembly. So, so they can make a law exactly. under this current constitution. Exactly. There's, there's a legal basis okay. for the National Assembly to enact a law to regulate pensions, to regulate the allowances of past public office holders. But the point I'm making is this. If you are not paying me, how do you regulate me? If you are, if you are not the one who is paying my salary, 
Well, How do you then regulate him? That's one of the issues that yes. you said that didn't... It's a confusion in the Constitution. constitution. Yes. But as at, the, as as at, at this now, moment, it's okay. within the exclusive... So what do you think... Why do you think that hasn't even been considered by the National Assembly? Because the Constitution also created a confusion uh, in Section 124, sub 5, of this same Constitution, which says that the House of Assembly of a state it has power to make a law to regulate the pension of a governor or a deputy governor. And that's the provision that the uh, executives of the states have taken advantage of to be able to get their houses of assembly to make these laws uh, approving all manner of uh, gratuity and pension for them. If you don't mind me taking you a little beyond this conversation, you wrote an article, you know, two days, three days back about the failed judicial system and all of that. Could this confusion that you have cited be one of those reasons why we have uh, cases that stay in court for longer than necessary? No, 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 I don't think so. Uh, the confusion is because the people who made the constitution uh, were a product of military uh, unitary system, which is centralized. It's a, it's a command system. So the idea of those that made the constitution is to concentrate everything in the federal. You have to go to Abuja to do anything. So we can uh, erase this confusion now by the judiciary interpreting to say once you say something is within the exclusive uh, legislative list, then you don't duplicate it to then ask the uh, House of Assembly of the state to have the same power. That's what is leading to the confusion. So I think it's for the judiciary to be able to eliminate that. Okay, now, if the judiciary is going to do you think, let me just ask you this, do you think there's anything the judiciary can do to list out all these confusion, the confusing, confusing uh, portions of the constitution, and uh, if that were to be done, what would be the effect? Once there is a pronouncement, uh, I know, like I told you, that Serap is in court, in the federal courts in Abuja. He has tabulated all these various laws and sued all the houses of assembly of states that have passed these laws including the Attorney General and also the Attorney General of the Federation and the National Assembly. So if the court makes a pronouncement to say that once paragraph 44 of the exclusive list vests this power in the National Assembly, then all those other laws made by the various House of Assembly of the states are illegal, then naturally these uh, laws will die. And uh, if they make a, a pronouncement to recover uh, those monies paid already, they will be paid back to the coffers of the various there, states. There, there's still a few issues to raise with you on this matter, but we'll take a short break. Thank uh, you very when much. When we return, we'll take this a little further. Please stay with us. Mr. Ebolu Adeboroa, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, is still with us this morning, and we are discussing political pensions and entitlements. And, uh, and some would say, Mr. Adeboroa, uh, this political pensions, the position you take depends on what side of the divide you say you, you are at any given point in time. Many of the people who go to these politicians would expect that while they were in office, they were getting something. When they leave office, they, they should also be able to get something. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons any of them would adduce that, look, we need this in order to be able to sustain our political face. I, I think I have no um, objection to that line of argument to say somebody who has risen to the status of a, a former governor of a state, of course, there are expectations. And I think that's the kind of thing that the National Assembly did with the past heads of state. 350,000 monthly, you know, as upkeep. That's what they said in that law, as upkeep allowance. That's, not bad. that's reasonable. But when you ask somebody to collect 100 million naira medical allowance annually, whether he's sick or not, it's just some kind of jamboree yeah. or jumbo. I think it was a if you say bomb it's a quiet bomb, that, that's the that law. They don't actually pay it except there's a need for it. So you can say medical. you are entitled to a medical checkup, you are entitled to treatment if you are sick, but you don't make it something endless, you know, that's in whether the condition or cause or not, and then you are entitled to. And then you say somebody should have a house in Abuja, about 700 million average if you quantify it, another house in Lagos. I just think that, you know, there's a way you can look at it against the average worker. Because my concern is that, assuming this is what occurs in all spheres of the life of that particular state, then you can say maybe if the state has the resources, then it should go ahead and pay. But look at how governors are resisting payment of 30,000 naira minimum wage to the ordinary worker. And then you see somebody demanding 10 million naira monthly, you know. And it's not that he's not active. 
He's still doing his own business. He's still even contesting office. So I think that the, the challenge will be that when you look at what the average worker is earning, and then the fact that those who have retired from civil service are dying on the queue every day to earn pension, then it's not mm. proper you know, when you juxtapose these together. Yeah. So I agree that they could be paid some amount of money, but not this. Not uh, no, not at all. OK, I'd like to take an unconventional route, mm. and this might be tricky. So essentially, wages, allowances, and what have you are meant to be some sort of reward for work done that is standard. But then when you bring it to this area, you meet a target and then you get paid, as it were. I mean, you go to work for 30 days and you earn your salary. Some organizations, if you don't meet that quota, it is reduced. So I'm just curious, can we have some sort of legislation or arrangement where you measure the performance of a political office holder or a public service holder such that their pay is commensurate to their outcome their performance, the output they put in, such that we can always measure that, oh, you deserve this, no problem, you can have it. Can we have that kind of mechanism in place? Well, I don't mind, uh, as so long as it's dependent upon the resources of the particular state, because the challenge with the national minimum wage, for instance, is that the governors are raising the point that you can't have a universal wage system, you know, and compare Lagos with Kebi State or Zamfara, that each state should pay according to their wealth and their capacity. When you have a state generating over 30 billion naira monthly internally generated revenue as in Lagos, Kano, Rivers, Aquaibon, they should be able to pay their workers 100,000 monthly. So when you say that, because what we are talking about now is not for active service, it's for those who have retired. No, I'm even saying active service. Uh, oh, for active like, service. I mean, how effective have you been? No, there's no controversy about those who are acting because everybody accepts the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Allocation Commission um, uh, methodology for paying those who are inactive. Whether you are so, effective, whether you perform well or not. Oh, yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. I mean, we need to ensure that there's this you know, fiscal responsibility. Money is put where money deserves to go to. You are paid as you perform. So can't we find a way to adjust that? I think it happened in Lagos here yeah, where, you know, somebody offered to uh, kick up the revenue of the state and set up a company and was able to do that. And then there was a percentage. Of course, you know the controversy. He went to AFCC until the governor said, look, we signed an agreement with him, you know, Alpha Beta or would a company like that. And if he's able to take up our revenue to this level, we'll give him so and so much. So it's possible to weigh the performance of a governor against the expectation, expected revenue, rather, that he will earn. But my problem is this. A public office is different from private office. You know, public office is something that you, you're on your own, you aspire to go to, to serve. You know, it's not like private office where you expect that for all the talent, for all the gifts, I want to be paid exactly for what I got. But a public office is you, you, on your own. You took a decision to sacrifice yourself for the public. And I'm not saying the person should not be paid for that. But it's not something you expect to take so much money from that uh, voluntary service that you are rendering. Because that's what is going on in other parts of the world. So I, for instance, will not decide to go and serve. Because maybe I love to earn my money as a senior advocate of Nigeria and be collecting money from clients. But the moment I abandon my professional calling, and say, I want to go into public office. I'm saying that I have taken a decision to serve. I'm donating my active life to the rest of Nigeria. So I should not expect to earn so much money as I would have earned as a private legal practitioner. That's okay. the point that I'm making. Just what, lastly, and you have just 30 seconds. Should this law continue in other states? Zamfara has abrogated it, and of course Lagos hasn't, and so many other states. What do you see, how do you see the people reacting in the short or long term? I, I, I don't think uh, we should abrogate the law entirely. My own understanding would be that there's need for some kind of revision. Uh, if you want to pay somebody, give conditions. If you have attained a particular age where you are no longer active and you can no longer earn money, then you'll be entitled to. And but when you say also that the spouse of the person should earn, 
Suppose there is a problem between the spouse and the husband and they have cause to divorce. You know, so you review it properly and ensure that the amount is not so high as to generate this kind of public outcry. There is no reason anybody should earn 10 million naira per month as an ex-governor. There's oh. no reason. Well, Mr. Ebu Oluwadeguru has been giving us his perspectives on these issues. Thank you very much for coming. And it's thank my you pleasure. For thank your you very perspectives. much. Thank you. Sunrise Daily continues in a moment. Please stay with us.